All right, so we're about to begin an interview uh, in downtown Montreal. Uh, first question, could you please state your full name? My full name is Julian Dion. I'm Thanks. from Sudbury, Ontario. Yeah, my home local is local 6,500. It used to be a very big local, 18,006. It's now about 2,500. Okay. And um, what did your parents do when you were uh, a child? What did they do for a My dad was an accountant, and my mother would uh, help him. Okay. And uh, you, for, for fun, what were your interests as a, as a child? What did you do uh, to pass the time? Playing, you know, like like most other kids. Uh, he was a very social guy. We all played outside. And okay. And how about in uh, in school? Did you have specific strengths or interests or things you wanted to? I was good in math. Okay. Very good in math. Yeah. Spelling. Okay. Only got nineties. Nice. Yeah. And uh, going further into your education, what uh, did you know exactly what you wanted to do growing up, or? No, I didn't. But after high school, I went to a place called Centennial College and took a technician's course there, automotive technician, which is what brought me uh, to go apply at, at INCO because they said they had an apprenticeship for me. Okay. So I was in. I, you know, they used to do medicals then, but not me. No? <laughs> I guess they needed an apprentice. <laughs> yeah. So apprentice mechanic at that time? Yeah, okay. apprentice mechanic. Sorry, yeah. Into the mechanics. And uh, what uh, what do you remember from that first job? Uh, well, that wasn't my first, but no. uh, but uh, uh, first with Inco. First time with Inco, yeah. Okay, first in the mining business. Mm -hmm. So what do you what do you what remember? do I remember? Uh, uh, remember is uh, wow, it was fantastic. Now I had a job because in those days, if you hired on for Inco, you were there for life, and it's not like your generation where you got to contracts. <laughs> yeah, contracts yeah. and contracts. So that's that's really what turned me on the most, uh, and um, what I remember the most. I uh, I remember my first day underground. They did two days of training, and underground is always drafty, always drafty. And uh, two days of training in a drafty drift. <laughs> okay, uh, drift. Uh, I don't know if you know what a drift is, but uh, goes with the old body. Cross cut okay. goes against. Mm -hmm. A drafty drift, and after a while, you get pretty cold. Your hands just freeze up, and so the second day, I, I was properly dressed. Because, <laughs> you know, they tell you, well, underground, it's always warm there. Yeah, well, it's always around 54, I guess, somewhere around there. And, uh, and I thought 54 was going to be warm, you know, but it isn't. <laughs> Not when you're standing in a drift, and, of course, it's high humidity. So I remember that very well at training. And uh, so, so then you wore gloves the next day. Well, oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, for so your entire life, you worked as a mechanic, Franco. My entire life, yeah. Okay. And when did you decide to um, join the union, or was that automatic when well, you yeah. joined Inco? It's a, it's a closed shop, so. Okay. If you, if you worked there, you were part of the union. Of the United Steelworkers. Yeah. At that time. Okay. It's, yeah. And when did you decide to get involved at the United Steelworkers? Or uh, why? Why? Yeah. Why and when? <laughs> yeah, and that's a very good question because a lot of people who became stewards, union stewards, uh, or occupational health and safety reps, or that kind of stuff, do it for the same reason. Their boss pisses them off. <laughs> and say, okay, okay, I'll get you. Mm. And I did. Because it usually upsets the the bosses if you well if, if you're you a steward implicate yourself in the, in the no, union. yeah now if you're a steward you're not the boss's friend anymore you're actually his enemy because if anyone has a grievance they'll come and see you and now you're talking to the boss as a, not as a worker uh, and boss you're talking to the boss as a, a griever and someone who's going to solve so you're talking to him on a different scale and. Inco didn't train their bosses very well because they're, they're too valuable. They couldn't spend the time training them. And that was a big peeve of the supervisors. We knew more than them. We had the Occupational Health Safety Act, well, we, we knew that inside out, upside down. Uh, Labor Relations uh, Act, you know, and employment standards, we knew all those. And they didn't. So a lot of them didn't feel very comfortable with that. 
especially when our pays were going up, 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 up all the time, and theirs was flat. Well, there, uh, there came a time when the hourly rated guys, especially the ones on bonus, were making more money than than the boss. Yeah. Isn't that something, eh? Yeah. Yeah. Because they weren't unionized. Well, because the company didn't give them a raise. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Were there specific actions that uh, early on that, that uh, your boss did, are, which are why it pissed you off? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> um, there's one I remember very well. Uh, uh, there's different mines, okay? So I was worried that I worked at Stobie uh, mostly, but when I went to Creighton Mine, my boss then, my, a man by the name of, uh, I don't know if I could say the name. But, uh, it's up to you. It's up uh, to you. His name was Al Keller. And my first day in the job, he says, Well, Dion, welcome. He says, Things are going to go just fine between you and I. He says, uh, As long as things go my way. That's, that's <laughs> it's like putting a flame in, in front of me, you know? Yeah. Now my challenge is to blow out the flame. And that's really the one action that uh, probably caused me to go the other way. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you still liked the job, but you just didn't necessarily like the, the management. I love my job. Mm -hmm. Mechanic is a good job. You're dirty, so what? You know, you clean up after, you know? It's like a plumber, right? You gotta clean yeah. up after. <laughs> Absolutely. And in those days, uh, gloves, um, uh, protective gloves like the nurses wear and uh, you know that kind of stuff it just wasn't around they didn't use it now they all use them but uh, so the best you could do is a barrier cream so that you, the cracks of your fingers weren't full of grease and uh, if you ever handle motor oil it's quite dirty it's hard to wash off yeah it's hard to wash off okay. so you got to wear barrier creams and that kind of stuff so. okay yeah and uh, so so once you joined as a steward is that you joined, yeah, uh, you I began as a steward, and same, in the same year, I became a health safety committee okay. manager. Were there anything, um, any specific um, rules, regulations that that you uh, worked to to bring upon as a self, uh, as a health and safety regulator? No, uh, a lot of people did both jobs, you know. Okay. And with that, the union spent a lot of time training me. I mean, there's my big thank you. It couldn't have been without them, without the sail workers. Uh, they'd probably still be in a, in a hole, you know. But uh, went to school. They, in those days, you had steward school, and steward school was a week long. You had a health and safety school. That was a week long. And took a lot of courses, did a lot of stuff, and then I became a, an instructor. So I got to teach other guys to be just like me okay. and help them recognize who they're talking to. Was there, um, so throughout your career, was there, a, do you remember a specific time where you were either working on a job or a specific mine um, and it was dysfunctional or very challenging? Well, you know, I, I also had a lot of training as a mechanic, so okay. that part was pretty good. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> uh, I remember my, my boss one time, I was working on a, a, a torque converter, like, like in a, a car. A little bigger, but <laughs> and my boss is, I'm underneath, and he's uh, on the side, and he says, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. I need this machine real bad. It's a rainy. Uh, rainy was his name. I said, just take it easy. I'll get it done. You want it today? You want it tomorrow? Tell me. He says, you know, these, these uh, studs, they break easy. I'm talking about it. No, no, but I need the machine. I need the shit. Then I said, oops, I just broke one. Now. They don't, they don't have the tool to take it out. So the job took an extra day, you know. You gotta train them too, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, um, I'm just trying to think here. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to see, I'd like to hear your opinion on, or your take on, from the beginning of your career to the end, 
What are the big issues that were there in the beginning that you'd say got a lot better throughout your career? And issues regarding, you can look at the labor aspect of it. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the bigger ones is dust. Some mines are dusty. Um, luckily, hard rock mines are not that dusty, whatever that means, because any no dust is good, but any dust can be harmful. So th that big improvement, um, uh, the way that um, the way the mine the mining methods, like before it was, you know, you'd have a jack leg drill. I don't know if you know what that is. But I don't know, drill like that. Anyways. Um, Mining methods changed an awful lot. So we went from jack leg to panel mining, where rather than drill out uh, a 12 foot round or whatever, you know, we went to panels which were like 200 feet high and, and you drilled from the top, not the bottom. Well, so that was quite a bit safer. Okay. And brought but, more productive, right? And it brought up production. Yeah. But now you didn't have any small falls of ground, you had some. Big falls of ground, you know. So you mine a panel, you take it out. There's still one here. You go around, you, mine, you do the other one, do another one. So they're staggered, eh? <coughs> Sometimes called, I think it's staggered uh, uh, panel mining. Okay. Very common in Elliott Lake, uh, mm -hmm. where they had lots of dust. Would the dust dust ever affect you? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> oh, I, yeah, I guess it could take a take a while to realize the world. I'm I'm still uh, yeah, I can still breathe pretty good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <That's not> good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That is but, good. Yeah, uh, I think dust uh, affects everyone. Yeah, um, not really. It's just a matter of uh, amount. Yeah, yeah. and, and it's a matter type of controlling and yeah, type absolutely because nickel dust is uh, like a it's not smooth around it. It's like little birds sticking out here and there, you know. And so when that gets in your lungs. The stuff that's small enough to get down deep in your lungs, when that gets in your lungs, it scratches the inside of your lungs. Like asbestos. Yeah, something like it. Yeah. 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 And, uh, asbestos is. Uh, I've found asbestos mostly on the outside of the lung. Mm -hmm. uh, nickel would be on the inside of the lung. Okay. Yeah. Now, uh, so nowadays you still. You, you don't work to retire, but you're still a member of the United Steelworkers? Yeah, uh, we have a group called SORTS, Steelworkers Organization of Active Retirees. Okay. And we have uh, chapters here and there, and that's what this conference is. I'm at a SOAR conference. Oh, okay. That's for retirees. So, so yeah. what, what kind of things do you work on at the moment? Worth mentioning? Well, well we, uh, we try and, of course, get more members and all that kind of stuff because that's important. I mean, we, we need money to operate. And we're trying to, what we need to do is politicize our members. You know, uh, if you think about seniors is the biggest voting block in Canada. Even in my organization, I, I can't control that block. You know, but really that's what we need to do is politicize. Uh, teach people why. And there's lots of good videos out there. And, like, uh, if you ever seen or heard of Mouseland, uh, it's a speech by Tommy Douglas. Mm, okay, yeah. Terrific. Very <laughs> simple. If you don't get the point after that video, but you got to get the people in for them to see it. Yeah, yeah. And I, actually, with um, the directors I was just speaking with, a uh, recurring theme was the challenges for the next generation to kind mm -hmm. of get the millennials to, to hop on that. Uh, the the labor the labor boat and mm -hmm. and really that training is probably most important us old guys we 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 went through it but we know what needs to be fixed and that kind of stuff our young guys uh, because of the economy and uh, don't know much because they're all on contract eh? lots of them are on contract and. There's no guarantee of lifetime work anymore and that kind of stuff. So they, it's kind of like working piecemeal. We've got to teach those guys that the road wasn't always paved. Mm -hmm. We didn't necessarily pave the road, not my generation, but before, just before us. And so we just 
widen the road a little bit, you know, and negotiate with better stuff, you know. And we got to teach them, otherwise they, they don't know where things come from. Uh, it was there all the time, forever and ever, you know. No, it wasn't. No. Yeah, it's things people can't take for granted. No, yeah. they can't. And just like, um, just like often I hear in the mining industry itself, let alone the, the labor aspect of the mining industry as well, as well as things that people uh, use every day that affect them in their lives every day, but they don't necessarily know or understand where it comes from or why mining is so important. Yeah. When we talk about something as simple as a phone, or, you know? Yeah. Well, to give you an, uh, an example of bad education, in Elliott Lake, they had a lot of silica, and silica was hard on the lungs, right? Silicosis. And so uh, there was so much silica that the management uh, handed out respirators to the people going underground. Of course, they had to breathe this aluminum dust, aluminum McIntyre aluminum prophylaxis, prophylaxis is what they called it. So it's, they had to inhale aluminum and dust to go down because some bright-eyed guy, uh, management guy, who stayed up late at night. We were working for the McIntyre Foundation, discovered that aluminum has, a, has an affinity to silica. They, they want to stick together. And if now it's aluminum and not sil sil silica, well, then you won't have any more silicosis. Right? Real smart. Because they didn't, they didn't consider that the aluminum may cause uh, things like dementia and Alzheimer's. Um, you know, and again, uh, in my group, we're, we're helping with that. We're going to have a, a clinic, and uh, you know, we're not scientists, but it's not hard to ask someone what his symptoms are, his or her, and you know, draw conclusions from that. And, and has has uh, are there still a lot of people that are seem to be coming out um, with these symptoms be caused from uh, from uh, labor and mining or, or things yeah. like that? Yeah, my generation. Uh, okay, yeah. your generation still coming out with. Oh yeah, yeah. but w and would you say after that, however, it it got drastically better? Well, yeah, except that that's one of those that takes so long, mm -hmm. yeah. so long to to. Some can take thirty years. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, so that's a real tough one. Okay. But we'll get it. Mm -hmm. like the gold miners uh, were in the same situation as the uranium miners and the same kind of stuff. They got recognized. Sure. Not for this, but they got recognized for cancers and all that. Mm -hmm. We had an old guy by the name of Bomer Sege. I don't know if someone, someone might have mentioned his name at some point. Right? Who's a health and safety guy and a real bull, you know? <laughs> He just wouldn't let go. We've had some great, great people in, in steel. Yeah. And I got to learn from every one of them. I'm the right age. <laughs> now, uh, in your opinion, there's no wrong answer here, but in your opinion, are there any events, people, disasters, anything whatsoever that you think must be mentioned when talking about the history of the natural resources in Canada, the history of mining or the history of Mining in regards mining. to the United Steel workers. Mining, logging, and so yeah. Yeah, and yeah, but mostly for us, mostly uh, mining and metallurgy mm -hmm. for this project. Any one instance, or yes, it could be. Uh, well, th I'd say the you know the, the past uh, within the past hundred years, it could be very recent. It could be um, mm -hmm. could be when you were younger. It could be before you. But anything you think is worth mentioning, whether it's a positive thing, a negative thing, someone, mm -hmm. something. Um, that you think has defined in a way, or changed in a way? In my eyes, um, uh, working at INCO, the, the, they've had, the, I don't know how many fatalities. There were so many fatalities that we, have, we had to have an inquest committee to go investigate and present the inquests and, and that kind of stuff. And so I remember one, guy, one time we had uh, four in one shot. We got crushed. We were working on top of a, a cage, an elevator, uh, and the muck came out of, of a loading pocket and crushed four guys to death. The one who stri struck me the most is the guy who had changed shifts. He wasn't supposed to be there. A young guy, young electrician, bang. And so fast, 
I don't know if you know what a run amok is, but think of diarrhea, run amok. You ain't going to stop it. <laughs> and yeah, all that. And I think uh, Inkel had like 700 deaths in the last 100, 100 years. Okay. Well. Yeah. I may be off by 100 or two, there, but something like that. And do you think at uh, one point these deaths affected uh, the future of mining for better in the sense that, you know, they were forced to change a lot of rules, regulations, laws? Better in terms, yeah. Mm. Uh, the only problem is, is when you go to an inquest and the jury, the inquest jury makes recommendations, there's nothing in any legislation that says those recommendations have to be implemented. So there's a big, big hole there. Is, uh, I used to be on the inquest committee and, and presenting at inquest and after the inquest they always give you the recommendations you know and some have been fixed already and uh, some have not and next thing you know they just disappear. The other thing with that is uh, the, how long it takes in Ontario to get an inquest. The Ministry of Labor in Ontario takes their stab at it but they, w they won't prosecute until about a year after. So while that prosecution is going on, there's no inquest going on. So the families, families sometimes wait three years to know how, well, I shouldn't say how, to, well, to know how their families died, uh, their loved ones. Yeah. It's terrible. It's, it's so aggravating for them. It sounds a bit like the West Ray mining disaster. Very much so. Yeah, with the Inquisition. And, yeah. And how, um, actually we were just talking about it earlier, how there was only, I think, <laughs> one uh, person criminally charged since the 13 years that the law has been, been implemented. Yeah, so. that's absolutely right. Mm -hmm. And that multiple there, there four guys. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a, what happened, well, the loading pocket there ran over because of many things. When they come in and they charged uh, the, the man who had opened the valve to control the muck, they charged him with four counts of criminal neg negligence causing death. Right at the mine. They wouldn't do that to management. Never. Never. Of course, they, they wouldn't have been doing that job. But, yeah. You know, but yeah. think about it. You're there. Uh, you're changed. You're going to work. And the cops show up. And uh, they handcuff you. And take you out. Now, isn't that nice? And was he um, was he sentenced or no no we uh, still workers have a, what we call the strike and defense fund we hired a very good lawyer Leo did and uh, yeah. and he got off okay mm -hmm. I was fortunate enough to have that that particular lawyer uh, at my house so <laughs> did I pick his brain <laughs> yeah. I bet now um, I often ask ask this question <clears throat> too. And it'd be interesting to see throughout your career, uh, how present or absent have women been throughout your career? And has that changed? Oh, it changed, I think it was 1978 when they changed the Mining Act. <clears throat> I shouldn't say when they changed the Mining Act, when the Occupational Health Safety Act replaced the Mining Act. In there, women were not allowed to work underground. So that law got changed and only around that, that era did women start working underground, except in a federal workplace because they weren't covered by the provincial legislation which is what I'm talking about now but in, in federal uh, jurisdiction women could always work in Europe they, they didn't have that clause so yeah <laughs> yeah so so not until 78 they could so, yeah in Ontario yeah. 75 or 78 yeah because it was always considered bad luck right before that uh, it was like a tradition that women weren't yeah. allowed on the ground Management always said that oh, it's because we don't want our women to be uh, molested on the ground. Incidentally, the Coroner's Act came about as a result of supervisors not wanting to be dumped in all passes. Oh no, no if, something, if something happens, you know, they're going to dump me. So I'm sure that's why, I mean, I've heard this, but I'm sure that's why they. Uh, the Coroner's Act has that stipulation in there, you know. Uh -huh. um, I'll um, I'll finish with one question, and that's if um, 
if you're if you're speaking to someone much younger, like a student, and they were thinking of getting into the mining industry, mm -hmm. what would you tell them? What would be your piece of advice or life lesson? I'd say be careful which mine you go to work for. There is, you know, let me let me use this this line. You know, uh, at Inco, we had the best supervisors in the world, bar none. But we had the other guys too. And uh, bad guys make the good guys look bad. And I, I often use that quote with management. And that's the truth. Doesn't mean you're a bad guy. But, you know, that guy's making you look bad. Mm. And that'd be uh, my advice. Be careful where you go work. I mean, the big mines, like, like Valley, and you know, they have better safety programs. And, you know, there's an old saying that everyone pays for a safety program whether or not they have one. And yeah, so big mines, big companies, a lot of safety. Uh, we brought Inco kicking and screaming and dragging. We brought them to the 20th century, uh, you know, and trained them and to the point where the union there trains management and workers together. And uh, the management pays. And uh, that's pretty good. So they were doing very well there until Valley Bottom. <laughs> After Valley, things went backwards. And what do you think of, because um, this is also something that comes up in, in a lot of these interviews, what do you think of the many of the Canadian, uh, big Canadian metallurgy or mining companies that have either disappeared or have been bought out by a few, like, so for example, Valley or yeah. Rio Tinto or ArcelorMittal? Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I wish our Canadian resources would stay in Canadian hands. Uh, when Valley bought, I mean, Valley uh, buying Inco, uh, the nickel is such a small part of their, all of their holdings. Yeah, it's maybe one, one and a half percent. So it's, it's really, it's not very much. And uh, Inco, in comparison to Valley, was, were angels. You know, of course it was, a, I'm serious. Of course, there was a long relationship there, and it took years to you know to, to mature and all that. And for one of the first things that Valley did when uh, when they bought uh, is uh, they took I think it was uh, the payroll sent it to Toronto from Sudbury, and uh, you know they they piecemealed some departments. You know this one they're still doing it in Brazil, for, you know HR or whatever it is. Eh? And they're not right at hand, you know, or you ask someone something. I mean, the president's not in Sudbury. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're centralized a lot, mm -hmm. of, a lot of it yeah. outside of Canada. Sure. So uh, they, uh, they could have uh, merged with the Falconbridge, what used to be Falconbridge. Would have been lovely. And, and you hear that a lot in Sudbury. Well, I don't know why they didn't sell to Falconbridge. Yeah. Well, Oh well, so uh, they make decisions, and they're so remote from the decisions that they don't see. I also heard that when they first flew into Sudbury on a chopper, uh, they flew over parking lots, uh, company parking lots, and someone said, "Oh, look at those nice cars they got. They must be making too much money." <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, so, no, uh, no, I, uh, what was that question again? It was, it was just uh, your thoughts on, on many of these Canadian companies mm. either, either yeah. disappearing or, or being bought out. Or, so, for example, Valley, like you yeah. mentioned. Or free trade. Yeah. All kinds. I mean, you got lots of woods, a lot of wood in, in BC, but it's not necessarily processed in Canada. And, and that's a good one because uh, Canada keeps getting sued by the states if we do as soon as we do anything in terms of free trade, and uh, we're, we're not winning. Mm -hmm. I was uh, on a Governor General's conference in 1987, and what we did, we toured 15 groups of 15. We toured Canada, and what we're supposed to do is bring, bring a report back to the Governor General, right? And we visited, in Quebec, the most perfect cow in the world. Uh, you got to find that funny. I, I thought it was pretty funny. 
big, big cow, and it was a beautiful, a beautiful cow. I don't know cows. What? Yeah, what determines that it's the most uh, perfect cow? I don't know. <laughs> Not a clue. Didn't ask, didn't want to know, really. So we asked a farmer, uh, 87. We asked him, well, uh, Mr. Farmer, um, what do you think of free trade? He said, well, let me put it to you this way. Smart old guy, you know. He says, if you have a field and you put a fence in the field, right in the middle of the field, you got one cow on one side and 200 on the other. At that time, 200 million, uh, you know, the states and our, in comparison, our million. He said, who do you think is going to gain the most? Are you, you don't need the answer. I mean, it's so simple. Yeah. That's one lesson from that conference I'll never forget. Well, thank you very much. Okay, my Appreciate pleasure.